for the uh, Athenian distance. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, have uh, Professor Michael Rudman at our department. Uh, Michael Rudman uh, is uh, a full professor in the uh, University of Hagen in uh, Norway, and he has a, g a big experience on uh, mechatronics uh, systems. And uh, he worked uh, as an associate professor in uh, uh, Japan uh, year, uh, years ago, and now he's uh, uh, in, uh, in Norway. Uh, I thank you for uh, uh, accepting to be our guest for this uh, two months period. And uh, I uh, thank you also for giving us this lecture on your uh, activity in these interesting uh, topics like uh, optimal dumping in uh, non uh, in dynamical system. Okay, so thank you again, and uh, I leave you all the uh, your role, uh, your, your, your the stage. Thank you. So thank you very much, Edo, for introducing me, and welcome everybody, and thank you for coming to this talk. Actually, my, my name is Michael Ruderman from University of Agder in Norway. And it is actually a very big pleasure to give this talk in seminar series of IEEE Control System Society, Italy chapter. And it is also a very big pleasure to be here at the University of Cagliari for a couple of weeks. And at that point, I would like to thank uh, the group of Automatica who is hosting me, and especially my colleague, Professor Edo Usai, for making it possible, but also Professor uh, Alejandro Pisano for sharing the office with me and also having some interesting discussion during this time. But now another topic what I would like to uh, present today is uh, actually coming from the developments of the last year and before last year. And the today topic is motion control with optimal nonlinear damping and convergent dynamics. So this is the outline of my seminar presentation. First of all, we will have a look on feedback damping in second order systems in let's say classical way, how we think about the problem of damping. And after that, the main part is motion control with optimal nonlinear damping. And by then I will show some extensions to real mechatronic systems because we will see that we need some additional adjustments. And I will show you also some experimental control example where such new optimal control, damping control uh, strategies um, evaluated and proved also in experiments. So let's start by feedback damping in second order systems. And uh, first of all, for the problem statement, we can ask ourselves what is actually optimal for set point control of a motion system, okay? So we know that if we have the motion system, we are rather governed by, by Newton's law and we can say, if you have only the focused concentrated lump mass system in generalized coordinates, we can consider every time some output, uh, let's say, position or displacement state y in generalized coordinates, and does it matter translational or rotational? And then we will see that uh, our input value, which is then the kind of quantity of generalized force, is u. And we know that the linear control is generally, to say, suboptimal. So if you look on the control value for set point task, we will see that actually it is the time optimal control in the way of bank bank, which give us a time optimal solution. Of course, this picture on the left hand side is not fully true because if we will integrate such shape uh, twice integrated such shape of the control uh, signal, we will not arrive on, on this form, but the principal message here, principal message here, that actually the physics limiting us in the actuation, let's say, boundaries. We cannot, we cannot expect from any type of octators unlimited amplitude corresponding to magnitude of the control signal. So it means that for limited control action, we have already very well known solution of time optimal control. We have some optimal linear feedback control, and then it should be something in between. So it means in terms of the performance, we can expect that maybe shaping the damping, we will not touch the uh, output feedback, but only the damping. We can reach some improvement in the performance 
been between suboptimal linear and time optimal bang bang type control. So you can think here about the variety of different motion systems, including, let's say, different types of actuators, electro, magneto, hydro, mechanical, piezo, whichever type of actuation. And here, just for example, to illustrate for one degree of freedom, here is a cut out from standard proportional directional uh, valve, or you can think about some standard servo motor coupled via the ball screw to the payload to be moved in translational in the, let's say, linear way on the stage. Or you can think about some hydraulic cylinder where you have also one degree of freedom and definitely by the Newton's law, we have also the moving mass. And if neglecting additional faster dynamic of uh, uh, magnetomechanical actuation, then we can end up with second order dynamics. So the message to be taken here is that linear controllers, linear feedback controllers are, to say, always suboptimal. So we will try to see and to look into possibility to improve some damping performance and to move from linear control to nonlinear. So now let's be more specific, the problem statement, and let's consider the problem of optimal damping for second order control systems. This already fixed output uh, of the relative displacement. So it means we have X1, which is a measurable output of interest. X1 is, say, position or angular position or whichever other type, uh, depending on the coordinates. And we have the system of the second order. So we have uh, double integration. And after that, we say that K, proportional feedback gain, is already fixed by some control policy. And now the question is, how should we think about the damping to obtain possibly performant control response, what is then behind this capital D? Uh, important to notice here that the output feedback is creating the potential field because it is actuating as a kind of virtual spin. So you know from basic of the linear control theory that if you have the proportional feedback of the motion system, then your proportional feedback gain is equivalent to a kind of virtual spring. And now let's focus on capital D. So first of all, if we assume zero damping, so capital D will be equal to zero, then the system becomes harmonic oscillator. So it is a classical second order system without damping, but it behaves in the trajectories which are elliptic shape as shown here on the slide. And we know that it is depending on the assignment of K. If we say X10 is our initial position, and if X1S is our, let's say, set position we want to reach, then of course, depending on assignment of K, we will have different level of maximal X2 value, meaning the maximal velocity. And if you look on such state trajectories in, let's say, time development, so the coordinates uh, x1, x2, depending on the time, we see that for x2, we have a classical sinusoidal, half of the sinusoidal, period of sinusoidal shape. And we could say, if we know how to bias the reference, how to bias the reference, this could be already the candidate. If we compare in terms of optimality, this kind of time optimal control, bang, bang, but with velocity bound, we see that it is still suboptimal. So this switching, this non-linear switching, we can be better because we achieve uh, here in total faster response because we are uh, reaching the maximal velocity earlier. And if we say that we have time optimal, meaning that we are allowing for control action here denoted by A between maximal A and minimal A, then of course, our linear control with a fixed uh, feedback uh, gain K is always suboptimal. But with this shape, it is something what is already possible if you are talking about control this smooth action without switching. And if you are compiled by application force, also to incorporate out with feedback, again, K is already fixed. What can be the problem with such strategy without damping at all. So D equal zero could be the candidate, but it will require two things. First of all, we need a kind of on-flight calculation of reference bias because we want to keep this value, which is actually 
directly the center of our ellipse. And uh, second disadvantage, once we reach our x1s, uh, we need exactly to stop and we cannot allow for post regulation. And here important to note that we are talking about some system still without perturbation. So we are analyzing ideal double integrator and we are not uh, considering any perturbation or any disturbances or any uncertainties in the system. Okay. So uh, with this background, we see what is actually possible to expect from output feedback with K still without damping. We will be always suboptimal comparing to time optimal switching bang bang. But now let's see what we can reach, what can be, let's say, additional advantage if you will shape the feedback damping capital. So first of all, to understand what will be advantage, we should have a kind of uh, initial situation. Let's analyze feedback with linear damping. Okay, so for linear damping, we will say that we will substitute our capital D by the standard linear damping term. There is a constant of D larger than zero multiplied with X2. Okay, so linear also known as classical viscous damping. So if we first have the situation, then our closed loop control system can be written in the state space form as here on the slide. And if you will rewrite this system from time domain into Laplace domain, then we have our characteristic polynomial function, which is here. We have alpha from S equal S square plus Vs plus K. Okay, this is something standard from, from, from linear feedback control theory. We teach it to the students, either in advanced bachelor or in master programs. But now let's see some tricks and let's have a look on the root locus. If you will consider the loop transfer function, but not with output x1, with output x2, meaning that x dot will be our output of input. Then our root locus becomes the root, root locus with d gain, given here in the formula. And if you will analyze root locus independency of D, we can have the diagram and very illustrative representation how the poles of the closed loop control system will change depending on D. If you will say, first of all, our D is equal to zero, we have no damping at all. We have conjugate complex pole here, here lying on the vertical, um, on the, on the, on the uh, ordinata on the imaginary axis. And if we will start to increase D, and if we will allow D to go towards infinity, then we see that both conjugate complex pole will migrate, will meet each other at this point. And after that, they will diverge and we will get one dominant pole, which is going towards zero, towards origin for D going towards infinity. And another one pole, which is then migrating to the left and going towards infinity. So now we can see that in terms of the performance, what we can expect as best possible damping for the linear feedback system, we could say that this is our optimal damping where we have double real pole. And then it is only decision where we want to place this pole by minus lambda, because out from characteristic polynomial, we have this expression for the double real pole, meaning that K is equal lambda square, and correspondingly our D is two square root from K. So we have nothing more to decide about the D. And why it is like that? Because if our D will be lower than this value, our system will have transient oscillations, then we have our poles line here and having uh, also imaginary part. But if we will assign our D larger than this value to uh, square root from K, then we will get the dominant pole, which is like slowing down the overall system response because it will be the pole which is migrating here to the right. Okay. 
So this is everything pretty standard and pretty known also for, for, for graduate or advanced master students in the courses. Uh, we can also, once we have fixed uh, D independency on K, we can consider the closed loop dynamics as initial value problem. On the left hand side, then we have second order uh, differential equation. On the right hand side, we have zero. But we are assuming some non zero initial value for X, which is classical for motion control system with set point. So we would like to start from some initial X1, zero. Initial velocity will be equal to zero. And then we have the analytic solution. We have general homogeneous solution for double real pole given by this equation. What we need to do, we need to solve it with respect to initial conditions. And after that, we will obtain, we will find our unknown constants C1 and C2. So it results in expression for X1 or X here in the coordinates on the left and X dot on the right. And this is pretty standard, pretty known. But now let's have a look what is actually, let's say, the space, the capacity for improvement if you will try to do something with damping. We can plot uh, x2 over x1 for the given initial value and final value, but then we will take uh, x2 on the logarithmic scale to better see the shape of the trajectory. And now we see that it is about, let's say, 20, 25, 30% of the total distance where we are reaching the maximal value of x2. And after that, naturally, the system start to say to decelerate. If thinking about the motion control, we have acceleration phase. If we have some constant velocity, then it is some steady state phase and then deceleration phase. And this is exactly if K is already fixed and we know that K should be fixed by some policy. Then in this green region marked here, we have a kind of potential for improvement, what we could at least want from the feedback damping to be improved comparing to the linear feedback damping. Okay, so this is our, let's say, degrees of freedom where we will try to be better in the convergence. And indeed, if we look on X dot trajectory developing in time and exactly analyze this equation here, then we see that we have a kind of nearly, nearly uniform growth at the beginning because T is pretty low and then we have this initial condition multiplied with K and then T. And then as long as the time is progressing, we have the exponential drop, which is more and more visible. And then we have exponential convergence towards end point. And now we see that actually ideal trajectory, even for some lower force, uh, let's say, force uh, requirements for acceleration, A and minus A, would have such shape. And exactly towards the end point, we are pretty far from the ideal convergence. So there is a space for improvement, and we see it here also in this green area in the slide. So to summarize, First of all, for linear system, we can expect only exponential convergence rate, which is virtue of mathematics, and it is a convergence of x going to zero, which is like slowing down when the state trajectory is approaching zero. So it means for different k values, differing by order of magnitude, if we plot uh, absolute value of x1 on the logarithmic scale, we can see how it is progress in exponential convergence, but now we have the logarithmic scale, that's why we have the straight lines. And if now we'll, if we will imagine that by some application, we need to fix some, let's say, bound of uh, admissible residual error. So what this application is requiring, let's say we will draw some horizontal line here, then we will see how slow can be such linear feedback control response because it is exactly visible here that by the exponential law, we are converging slowly towards equilibrium. So with this, let's say, problem statement and background in mind, now we have seen what is possible from optimal linear feedback controller. Let's move on and let's talk about the motion control with 
uh, optimal nonlinear damping, which was introduced two years ago. And this control was introduced. Uh, you can find more details in this uh, journal publication, Journal Franklin Institute. And uh, the feedback control system is given in these equations. It is again the double integrator system. And we will recognize that what, what is changing is only the damping factor. Okay, the nonlinear damping factor is uh, given there. And now we see that such control can have some singularity. And that's why we need to restrict our state space uh, to the um, second order uh, space, excluding the values where x1 is equal to zero, but we are not in the origin. Okay, if you have, let's say, zero velocity for, uh, if you have not zero velocity for zero relative displacement. Uh, but since the system is unperturbed, we will see that actually this critical, let's say, subset is never reached because it is just we are limiting our initial conditions. We cannot start at zero position with non-zero velocity. And otherwise, we will be automatically always repulsed away from the ordinate. And after that, we will converge always either in second or in the fourth. So what is principal modification? Again, let's recall that we are talking about second order system. We have fixed K. So we have naturally the feedback of the output position, which is measurable. And after that, it is only the damping map D, which we have modified. But now it is non-linear. And then we will compare. If we compare again the convergence of the output state of interest on the logarithmic scale, we see that for linear, we will get only the exponential convergence. But for the proposed uh, optimal nonlinear damping, we will get hyper exponential convergence shown here in red color. And actually, on the logarithmic scale, we see a kind of uh, quadratic parabolic state. And again, if you will fix for some application related reasons some bound some limit of accuracy we want uh, to reach, we will see that the progress in convergence in time will be much more, uh, let's say, visible comparing to, to, to linear feedback tempering. And key is the same. So we have fixed, we have no, let's say, policy, we have no additional possibility to adjust K. K is already given. Okay, what is also important to say is that this, uh, Optimal nonlinear damping, we will use the abbreviation OND later on in the presentation. This OND control given by equation four and five allows also for input signal because now the input signal we need to recall that it is double integrator. What is entering in the double integrator system is this total expression we summarized as V. And this input signal can be also saturated. So actually, in all pretty all physical systems, we are in the situation that we need to consider some saturation of actuation. We cannot allow even temporary for, let's say, control force going to, to infinite or to very large values. Uh, the analysis and proof are given in the journal article, but just to, to, uh, to show and to give impression how it changes how change the trajectory in convergence when we have um, such such saturation issue. Uh, we see, for example, for larger values of K, uh, in green line it is without saturation, and once it is with saturation, we will be staying in the uh, limits for, for this total V between minus and plus uh, capital S, and after that the shape will be the same. And if we will decrease K, of course, starting from some K here, K equal to 50, we will not be longer in the situation that we have the saturation. So this control allows also to use the actuator saturations without violating the properties of convergence and stability and so on. Okay, so now let's talk a bit. Let's see some, some, some main statements and properties about the stability of OND control. So OND control is global asymptotically stable and converging to the origin alongside a tractor. And this attractor is given by equation x2 plus square root from k x1 equal to zero. And graphically, we see that it is just straight line in the second and fourth quadrant. And it doesn't matter where we will start in the state space. 
we will be always converging alongside this attractor. It is like allow me to go back to the previous slide. We see uh, some char of trajectories and where the density of the lines is growing. This is exactly the uh, position, the locus of attractor. So it means that our our convergence is uh, alongside this attractor closer to the origin. So how to in this attractor is pretty simple. We just need to rewrite equations 4 and 5 in the state space form. OK, and after that, take um, the time derivative of the state vector on the left hand side to zero. And after that, we get this expression. And if we evaluate this expression allowing only four real solutions, we will get this uh, line. And if we will perform, no matter how many, Numerical simulations from different initial points, we will see that every time closer to the region, we will be uh, converging alongside this attract. Okay. Uh, further on, apart from, from graphical, let's say, phase plane analysis, we can also go for classical, for standard uh, proof of stability and analyze the uh, Laponov function. Uh, let's consider the Laponov function candidate, the quadratic one, which is just a superposition taken quadratic with the, the states and additionally scaling x1 square by k and then for this Laponov function candidate v dot will be the expression and we can recognize that it is uh, not uh, uh, negative definite but only negative semi-definite because if you will say x2 is equal to zero then v dot is equal to zero but it doesn't bring any big problem because we can apply the stability we can use we can make the stability proof by standard invariance LaSalle principle, meaning we can investigate the situation where x1 <laughs> is not equal to zero, but x2 is equal to zero. And then we will still get the proof of uh, global uh, asymptotic stability. What is also important to recognize, and uh, more details are to be found in the uh, article, uh, that apart from global uh, asymptotic stability and convergence, we can investigate the passiveness of the system, and we will see that for closed loop passivity of the system, this condition should hold. And then we can recognize that in the state space, only the white uh, regions of the sub subspace uh, marked by, by, by white color, we have the system to be passive. And in this gray shadowed regions, closer to the abscess, we will temporarily lose the passivity of the system. What does it mean physically? It means that before crossing the abscess axis, before uh, having uh, velocities that are crossing, we will like additionally inject energy in the system because the system is temporarily not passive. And it provides us like additional robustness for convergence because of Let's say if for some perturbations which are not considered in this work, but if you have some, then here the system is gaining gaining additional energy, and it provides uh, that we are not sticking once reaching the, the axis. So passivity property is also useful to be shown here. Now let's have a look just to compare for summarizing. Uh, the numerical evaluation of linearly and nonlinearly damped response. Uh, what we see here is that nonlinear damping brings our X2 trajectory velocity closer to ideal bank bank type response. Okay. So means in green we have a linear damping response, K is the same uh, feedback gain factor. Nonlinear damping is here in, in, in red. And if you look on X2 trajectory, then we see that our nonlinear damping trajectory, optically at least, comes closer to ideal trajectory where we have just some uh, control values A and minus A. And uh, we are, let's say, like approaching what is better possible to reach without switching. Okay, so the control remains uh, continuous and we don't need to fix points, we don't need to analyze it in terms of the time, uh, access, where, and how to switch. So we have classical uh, continuous with the control. Okay, so uh, nonlinear damp shape is also to be like independent from the shape point of view from K. 
you see it here by variation of k by order of magnitude, k equal 10, 100, and 1000 for qualitative comparison. Because now we see that it is only like scaling of correspondingly stretching the x2 trajectory visible here, but it doesn't principally change its uh, shape. So it is just only scaling. What is also important to say and what is also important to analyze is actually the behavior of introduced optimal feedback controller from, let's say, energy analysis part. Why? Because if you will compare it with other types of the feedback, like 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 discontinuous Coulomb type feedback, or what we have in the friction case, or linear feedback, what we have had here on the blackboard, then first of all, let's write the total energy function equivalent to the Laplace function given here, and then our e dot will be the expression given here, and then we can recognize that what we have in brackets x to dot is actually our dynamics. And first of all, in our dynamics, we have capital D, which is not yet assigned. Okay, So it is like degrees of freedom, what we could think about and what is actually behind the proposed uh, strategy. Now let's distinguish and let's analyze E dot for different types of damping. If we say our damping capital T is a linear one, then we will get E dot equal, if we evaluate the upper expression, we will get E dot equal to minus D X2 square. So this is a classical one. So it is quadratically depending on the velocity. If we will now consider nonlinear constant damping, so the damping rate is a constant, which is a classical case, for example, for Coulomb type damping, which is a physical phenomenon of Coulomb friction, then we see that our E dot is equal to minus d absolute value of x2. So this quadratic dependency is disappearing. Okay? So the ratio is proportional to ratio of displacement, to velocity. And if we will analyze the proposed optimal nonlinear damping, we will get the expression E dot, which is then cubic in the magnitude of x2 and inverse in x1. And this is the most significant property. Why? Considering the energy corresponding to power balance will yield if we write the total energy expression and after that take time derivative, then we have the power. We have the supply power, we have dissipated power, and we have the conservative power due to conservative forces. Okay, so there is no dissipation, it is only exchange of energy between potential, potential, which is driven by by K, because it is a potential energy of the spring, and kinetic, which is then provided by, because we have the motion with certain velocity X2 not equal to that. Okay? So, and the supply energy, we can consider, because we have say that our control, initial control, which is already fixed, is actually proportional to the controller. Then we consider the supply power of control, like controller who is pushing the energy into the system, is through this potential field. So now it is quite natural in this way of analysis to say then our damping term is exactly responsible for the power of dissipation. And here we are. For linear damping control, if you will rewrite this, uh, this uh, power balance, we will get this expression. On the right hand side, we keep conservative. Then we see what is supply and what is the damping. And for nonlinear damping, in the same way, we see what is the damping here. And now, as engineers, let's analyze and look what does it mean. It means that for linear feedback damping, this dissipation of energy is independent of the control error. It doesn't matter where we are doesn't matter where we have been, because initially we wanted, if you say this is x um, one zero, and we want to reach some x one set point, then independently on the distance, we are dissipating the power, we are dissipating the power is the rate which is actually here. So it is always proportional to the square of the velocity. From the positioning, for motion control. It is less efficient. It doesn't take into account where we are, how close we are to the, to the target. 
It is imagine you are just riding the car. Why do you need to brake right from the beginning if you know that you need to pay attention just on the next traffic light where there are some, some, some people going around? No, you would like to drive possibly fast and not dissipate the energy, not brake and not press on the pedal. And just approaching closer to your target, you would like to dissipate energy more efficiently and with, let's say, higher dissipation rate. And this is exactly what the proposed uh, nonlinear optimal damping controller is doing. We decrease this dissipation power for larger control errors because we are inverse to X1. Okay, having said this, now let's have a look on the dissipation properties of OND control in more details. And uh, another reference I will, by the end of the presentation, give the full list of references. But it was in the next conference paper, uh, ISAC 1. And uh, now let's look on energetic aspects of regularized OND control because we needed regularization to avoid the singularities. And uh, we will not go into the text, we will find it more details in the paper. but. Now we have for the same Laplace function candidate, the derivative is this expression, because now we have additionally just introduced this additional regularization term mu. I will introduce it properly on the next slide. But what is important here to look is to the shape of the absolute value of the energy dissipation, V dot, okay? And we see that the rate at which the control system reduces the energy is cubic in error rate, okay? So depending on E2, which is the error of velocity, and hyperbolic in the error size, so it is inverse. And if you now we will make the projection of this three-dimensional plot, it is exactly here. We see how this absolute value of V dot is depending of E1, which is the position error, and how it depends in the cubic way from the E2 which is a velocity error. So two most important messages to be taken here. First of all, again, regularization factor mu, which is indeed not additional parameter of design, but just to uh, bypass and avoid singularities. So mu is larger than zero, but much slower than k. You will see it also in the simulations. It prevents the infinite energy rate. This is logical, because otherwise from p equation 13, you will see it is uh, Singularity once our E1 is equal to Z. Okay. And it's unsure finite control action. It ensure finite control action exactly at this point. Okay. And at the same time, the cubic dependency of energy rate from error rate enables to what? Enables control to react faster to error dynamics. And why it is important? Because it is like in the case of non steady state trajectories, for example. We are not riding some constant velocity, but we have some acceleration, deceleration cases. Or we have additional external perturbation, which are like in hybrid system, like kicking out us, and we are moving far from velocity error. Then we can uh, stronger react and we can uh, better damp the system. Okay, so now uh, this uh, regularization of the introduced uh, aerodynamics, um, this introduced regularization factor, mu should be much lower than k, and this uh, coordinates of, uh, of the error, E1 is x1 minus r, where r is some reference, reference trajectory corresponding to then x2 uh, minus r dot is uh, E1 dot. Uh, we have our error dynamics given here by this expression. So this is the error dynamics. And what is important also is that all previously shown OND properties are preserved. But what we have reached, we are now preventing, so we are avoiding singularity if our trajectory is in a situation where we have E1 equal to zero and E2 is not equal to zero. So this is most important because before we have said that if it was initially X1, X2, and we have allowed all, let's say, uh, initial conditions apart from to be on the axis, on the ordinal, because otherwise we will have the singularity of so the trajectory like this. Now, if we want to track 
some dynamic trajectories and we introduce E1 and E2. Now with this regularization term mu, we can also cross E2 axis. So there is no problem also of zero crossing. Okay. So now let me talk about um, a bit about the convergent dynamics okay. of OND control and um, convergent dynamics is, is let's say mathematical and theoretical framework was selected just for the sake of elegance. I found it quite uh, interesting. Uh, one need to say here that one is interested not in the stability of one particular solution or invariant set, but stability and properties of all solution and some limited solution X bar to which all other trajectories will converge. It's also important to say that this concept of convergent dynamics is uh, uh, introduced by Dimitrovich six still in the 60s, but there is a lot of uh, very fundamental theoretical works done on the other, let's say, name of uh, terminology, incremental stability or contraction analysis. Okay, so here I will refer to this uh, publication in system and control letters from 2004, but for K differences, for K differences between uh, convergent and incremental stability, I also referring to this publication from Rufa, Van der Wolf and Muller uh, from 2013. Uh, all in all, we would like to say on compact sets, convergent and incremental stability, they are implying each other. So there is no difference whether they are talking about convergent or incremental stability if we are on the compact set. So here just to summarize some preliminaries of the convergent dynamic, notation of convergent dynamic, if you have the dynamic system given here by x dot, the vector form, uh, equation one. Then the definition one is the system is said to be convergent if for all initial conditions, t zero, initial time, and initial state x zero bar, there exists a solution, which is called x bar, which satisfies these two properties. And this solution x bar is called limit solution. And what is most important is that all other solutions of system one will converge at time. Time is progressing, will asymptotically converge to this limit solution. So in other words, the solutions of convergent system will like uh, forget the initial conditions. And after that, they will all converge to this uh, limit solution. OK, so more details you can find in both references and uh, especially this one. But what is important if we use such, uh, let's say, theoretical body, the framework of convergent dynamics, is important to show that the system one to be convergent, we should find some positive definite matrix P, which is symmetric, so that this matrix J, where we have to, 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 to evaluate the Jacobian, we have to take the partial derivative of F with respect to vector X, that this matrix J is negative definite, okay? And then uh, we should say that uh, in the origin we have uh, the, the, the map F uh, absolute value should be lower than some constant, so it should be finite, and then the system is convergent. And it was possible to show that this uh, regularized OND control is also convergent. Um, we will not read all this text, but important statements here that now we have ONG control aerodynamics given by equation 7, 8. We are evaluating the Jacobian uh, of F and give, uh, get, uh, get the expression given in the equation 9. And after that, we can evaluate the uh, negative definiteness of this J, which is this expression, but we see it is only negative semi-definite. But again, by LaSalle, by invariance principle, it's not a problem to show the definiteness, not only semi-definiteness, because we see that if we will substitute E2 equals zero into equation eight, then we will get this expression. So we'll always have the repulsion away and we will not stick on the abscess axis. So the system is, uh, the system seven and eight is uniformly convergent. It means that in the origin, in the origin of our error space E1, E2, we have our X bar unique limit solution. So all solutions will be converging to this unique solution. So let me show you some numerical evaluation of that. 
uh, output trajectories for different initial values. So we see on the left how the X1 trajectory progress with time for different initial values. And in the phase uh, plane, in the phase portray of E1 and 2 coordinates, we also see how all these trajectories will converge to the origin. And origin means we have zero error in the position and zero error in the velocity. And it is also recognizable on the left hand side because R is our initial trajectory. What is also maybe important to, to, to mention here, because uh, as I claimed before, mu is only regularization factor. And now if you see that our K has been selected by 100 and mu is selected by 0 0.0001, so we have like a sixth order of magnitude difference, you can recognize that mu need indeed just to be some small positive constant because there's a regularization factor to avoid the singularity. Okay, so uh, talking a bit about the motion control, numerical example which show the performance. Uh, imagine you want to, to, to go from position uh, zero to position one, and after that uh, we have some, some linear slope uh, reference, and to see the difference between the critically damped optimal PD feedback controller, which is proportional derivative controller, and the proposed nonlinear optimal uh, damping controller, best way we look on the plot of X2. Because in ideal case, our reference will be square shaped uh, uh, pools. And we see now how the nonlinear control in green performs, how suboptimal linear controller with critical damping uh, aerodynamics is given above is performing in gray, and we see that we need, we need this regularization term here, because even on the level of numeric, in this numeric also some output measurement noise was uh, purposefully introduced to, 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 to see these results. We see that for zero mu in red uh, color, we have some outliers which have nothing to do with the model dynamics. It is because we have not regularization term. So regularization term is important, and also here we see a uh, difference between gray and green, what our optimal damping brings to us. So uh, I still have something like five or six minutes. Let me introduce some experimental evaluation of uh, these results. But first of all, we need to talk about some small extension because uh, I was mentioning we are considering most simple case of second order system double integrate. In the reality, we will have some inertial term and we will have also some damping term. So oftentimes, some mechanical motion systems can be written as given here. And here X1 is the output motion state of interest, okay? And then we have some parameters A and B, uh, like given here. And after that, one can bring it also to more convenient for engineers form, where we are talking about the time constants, tau and where we have some additional uh, gaining factor capital K. Okay, so such a dynamic system here in the coordinates of the velocity on the right can be quite in standard way identified in frequency domain. So we need to, to perform some, some identification, collect enough point of frequency response function. I will show you also example of evaluation. It's not a big issue. And now we need the kind of scaled or in deep control, what I showed you on the previous slide, but now we need additional scaling to, pres uh, to, 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 to save and to, uh, to, let's say, to have the same properties, okay? So now we see that uh, before this damping term, we need to incorporate A over B, and additionally, artificially, we would like to introduce this term, which is not usual because it is like having positive feedback coupling, one over B, X1 dot. It is exactly to cancel our additional linear damping in the system. So, and if the motion is perturbed by some additional matched input uh, perturbation factor um, xi, then our system is just additionally excited on the right hand side. And if you assume for simplicity reference equal to zero, so the sake of simplicity, non zero initial conditions, we see it here, then we will converge not to zero, but to some steady state error, which is also known for PD control. As long as, as, long as we have no 
integral control action, PD controller in standard mechatronic way in robotics also has this property of some steady state error. But we need to remember that proposed nonlinear optimal damping controller is converging much faster, and as long as psi is disappearing, then the convergence is again given, or we have some residual steady state error. So now let me show you some experimental evaluation, which was done as in laboratory in projects uh, where I'm working at the University of Angler, a school professor. Uh, this is setup, which is like multifunctional setup. We can adjust additional oscillating mass, but now it is only one degree of freedom, second order system based on the voice coil actuator, experimental setup. And what is our control uh, structure, control scheme? We need to identify only such linear dynamics. So we need to determine capital K and tau. And then we can compare PD and OND control to each other. One important issue is that we are not measuring X2. So for obtaining X2, we need a kind of estimator or observer. And in this case, we are going for standard robust sliding mode controller uh, differentiator. So it is one from, from Levant or uh, second order. And here, just to show you what is the discrepancy and what we can expect between the theory and praxis, this is identified system. Even here, the plan, we have the measurement and frequency response, and uh, we have the uh, simple second order system. So it is like free integrator and then uh, time delay tau. And then if we evaluate, if we evaluate how we get our velocity, then we can compare what is already low pass filter discrete time differentiation of X1 comparing to sliding one differentiator T and black so that we can rely on signal and we do as if we know our Y1, we know our uh, velocity. So uh, I hope the video will work. So this is just to give you impression how the system is behaving. Yes, it is working. So you see, even if you apply some disturbance, not artificially injected disturbance through the signal, but mechanical disturbance, like, you know, by finger, you are you're bringing it out from the already set position, then it is still stable behavior. Let me show you once again, because video was a bit corrupted. Now it is running. So we have the step. And after that, manually, we are trying to disturb this. Of course, gravity can be precompensated in a forward way. It doesn't need to be included into the analysis of everything. But then we have exactly the control scheme like it is shown here in the slide. OK, what is about the performance? Must be interesting, because we would like to compare it with standard PD critically damped controller. And we have the same K factor for both. So it is a fair comparison. Feedback is fixed, and then it is only the damping. OPD controller is this critically damped system to have both poles in uh, both real poles coinciding with each other and our ONG control. Here you see the trajectories for tracking 0 0.5 and 2 hertz. And despite a larger overshoot in the beginning for ND, after that, the leg of um, ONG controller is smaller. So it is closer following the trajectory. And here, the evaluated step, if we are applying some additional reference, we see that it is not converging exactly to the reference value, which is natural. For PD controller, we would expect the same because we have no integral control action, and obviously we have some uh, additional friction in the system, so we have some steady state error. And now to see the comparison in experiments. When we are tracking the trajectory, uh, in the X1 coordinates, it looks pretty the same. But if you look on how control value uh, is progressing, we see that OND controller is not requiring more control effort. So both few uh, signals are pretty coinciding with each other. But both during the transit, not transient, but steady state motion phase, we have largely smaller error by OND. And especially coming to the steady state, here we see at the constant set point, the control error of OND is also smaller compared to PD. So I think we are pretty in time uh, because we needed to finish at one. So this is actually all what I wanted to discuss and to show you today in this seminar. Here I give just some references to related works 
of this presentation, what has been already published before. You can find it in the slides. And at this point, I would like to thank all of you. Thank you very much for attending this seminar. And I have also to make acknowledgement because this work is starting from this year, supported by Join Norwegian French Mobility Program. There is a discussion with colleagues from Lean ongoing, and uh, this is a Research Council Norway grant project number given here. Thank you very much again, and I'm also open for questions. Thank you. Um, do we need to switch the panel? So, Mauro, how, how should we do it with? Maybe I will give the microphone. No, it's fine. Then I will keep it. Uh, thank you. That is a good question. Uh, maybe I need to go here on this slide because uh, there are two points. There are two points. Uh, first of all, at the beginning, I said we are considering uh, unperturbed system. So we are talking about, um, let's say, ideal uh, double integrator. And if we extend the system to be more realistic, like motion control system, we still need A and B to be known. So we know, we, we assume we know the parameters. So uncertainties and additional perturbations are not explicitly yet part of this discussion. What we are discussing with, with colleagues from Lille is, uh, first of all, such framework would be as next step very natural to be tried, be extended by some integral contraction because there is no bypass um, to go around. If you are talking about robotics, PD control is for analysis and known from time of publications of Spunk and co-authors is a feasible framework, but we need some integral control action. Th this is one point. What is already shown and what we what I tried to, to analyze, what is shown here on, in, this, um, uh, in this equation is actually if we say that our perturbation is matched, so the access point is the same as uh, generalized uh, control forces, then we can say that it will only violate uh, zero steady state accuracy. So we will have some residual steady state error. But it will not, as long as it is matched disturbance, it will it is not expected to, 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 to drive our system in terms of stability. It will not violate our main stability analysis. Because as long as we have introduced the regularization term, we have no longer singularity, and the system is also passive, as I told, uh, just apart from these two small regions. So we will always, we will always converge into the second or fourth quadrant, and after that, converge alongside of a trunk. But explicit analysis in terms of sensitivity to perturbation, it is not yet have been done, and it is what we are yeah, planning to do in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I see, I see, I see. Alejandro, thank you for question. In, in general, for second order control system, of course, there is a like open avenue to do something also for output feedback. But as I claimed and stated right at the beginning, we are not really looking on what is the feedback of X1. So we say K is already like fixed by some other control policy. And this is something what is understood also under the like total gaining factor of control. This is what like let's say industrial people are oftentimes used to talk. So we have proportional feedback gain. We are not coming around of this, let's say, effect just because of some specification or applicational point of view. 
We are only explicitly focusing on what can be done, what can be improved in terms of the banking, and this is uh, actually the presented approach. But if trying to extend, like having not only now we have like only one degrees of freedom, but if trying to have like two degrees of freedom and to do something additionally with nonlinear output feedback term, it will be another class of controllers, roughly spoken, I would say. But this is not what 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 is in this work. Uh, 